Hello guys, so in this video we are going to learn how this basic program to print hello world works. So let's try it out, try it out. and here it opens. Now if I press on run, you can see the hello world is printed on this screen. Now you might be confused why we have put it double slash here, why we are using public, main, static, void, system.out.println. We are going to learn each of these thing one by one. Now let's see what are comments. So these are called as comments. So this whole line, this whole line is called as comment. Anything marked with double slash is called as comment. So suppose if I mark here also double slash, then you can call this line also as a comment. If I mark here also double slash, then you can call this line also as a comment. Suppose if I remove this, Okay, then you can't call this line as a comment. So now we know how, what to call comment and what not to call a comment. Now we'll see what is the use of these comments. So the first use of these comment is if you do not want to execute a line of code, then you can make that as a comment. So here earlier you can see hello world is printed due to this line was executed. Now I don't want this line to execute it. So I mark this with double slash. And if I click on run, just wait, you can see no output to print. Suppose if I put here like, uh, I copy this and I put here and I make this like, just let me one, two, three. And I again copy this and I again paste it. And this time I will make it like one, 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 one. And I will comment out this line. Now if I run, let's see what happens. So you can see only this line was executed. This line and this line is not executed because they are made as comments. So now we are clear with why to use comments. So there is one more use which I uh, haven't explained you. So uh, the second use is that if you make a line as a, mostly we make a line as a comment so that if someone else is going to read your code after 10 years, he will be able to understand your code more easily. So there are two uses. First use, if you don't want to execute a line and the second, to make your code easily understandable. Now let's see what is a class. So here you can see this Sony code is called as a class. Why this is called as a class? Because this is declared with this class keyword. Suppose if I remove this class keyword, then you can't call this Sony code as a class. So here, this is a class. Now let's have a look on some of the properties of the class. So the first property is all the code of the program is written inside the main class. Okay. So here is suppose I make this also. Suppose if I make one more class. So to make a class, I have to write first class keyword. And if I make one more class like this, so you can't, this is not a main class this thing dog is not a main class but sony code sony code is a main class why we have called this as a main class because the file inside which this code might be saved has the same name as that of the class name okay so the name of the class and the name of the file will be seen that's why we are calling this class as a main class. Now, the property was is that all the code of the program is written inside the main class. So here you can see, right? All of this code we have written inside the main class, Sony code only. Suppose if I do like this, suppose if, uh, if I make another class, okay? Now, if I do like this and if I come here and I remove this public keyword, I remove like this and I make it like this and I am going to remove this too. Okay. Now let's see what happens. So here you can see some error came up. So make sure that you, uh, that whenever you write a code, you write a code inside your main class only. Don't write outside of it. So this was our second property. Uh, now this property the name of the main class and the java class should be the same so here you can see i have just showed you with this diagram suppose you make a file with the name sonycode.com sonycode 
dot java and you save a class with the name sony code and then you execute this file you will not see any error suppose if you make the class name as main dot java or whatever you want just it, it won't be a sony code okay then main dot java and you save a class with the name sony code and then you run it you will see a error so this is the second rule which you have to remember that the name of the file and the name of your main class should be same now in this code let's see what is this main function does so the main function is mandatory in every java program suppose if i remove this main function if i make it like m u a i n and if i run this code okay so there's some error coming up what that error is first i have let me remove this and let me just reload this just a minute okay so suppose if i make it like this okay and now if i do so here you can see it gives us this error mean method not found in class sony code so make sure whenever you make a java program you have a method with the name main so i remove that e now the method with the main is there so we don't see any error now why we use this main method the reason why we use this main method because the execution flow of every program starts from the main method so whenever the compiler start executing the code of this sony code class it first come to this main method then it start goes inside this main method and start executing the flow of the code so this is how main method work the last thing we have in a program which is pending for us is that system dot out dot println so whenever you want to show some text on the console like here i wanted to show hello world so what i just simply did i passed hello world inside double quotes inside into this println function that this println function has printed this hello world on the console so we use println function to print the output on the console so our print is done main is done class is done comments are done now these things are pending like why we use public why we use static why we use void and why we used args as of now just learn that whenever you are making a main method you have to write public static void and string args and whenever you declare a main class make sure you declare it with a public keyword suppose if you remove this public and you run this you'll get an error it says as public class not found so these are the points you have to remember and as we move on in this tutorial i'll explain you each and everything why we are using public why we are using static why we are using void now we will look what is a variable how to use a variable and how to create a variable so here in this code when this line execute a variable will be created and it will hold a value 20 so let's see how a variable will get created in the memory so when this line execute what happens in ram so this yellow part is a ram in this ram a memory location this white area is a memory location will be created in that memory location a value 20 will be stored as we are assigning here a 20 that's why in this memory location a 20 is stored this memory location is called as a variable so this age is not called as a variable this memory location is called as a variable this age is called as an identifier as you can say the name of the variable so for the sake of simplicity we always called age as a variable but in technical terms age is not a variable it is an identifier or you can say the name of variable now what happened when this piece of code executed a memory location is created in a ram and the memory location is having a value 20 and this memory location will have some address so let's assume that address is hash a1 to b4 and this address gets stored in this identifier or you can say the name of variable now when this code executes what happens first here the value is stored in a variable that is 20 is stored in an age variable and here when this value when this piece of code runs the value stored in the ram is accessed 
and printed here. So here you can see h colon 20 is printed. So this is how a variable works and this is how a variable stores a value in a memory. Now we are going to discuss what are data types and what are the different kinds of data types. So first let's see what is a data type. A data type is a keyword that is used to decide what kind of data can be stored in a variable. So here we have defined this variable var1 and here you can see this int. This int is a data type that is used to decide what kind of value can be stored in this variable var1. So let's run this code and see. Now here you can see I am trying to store a fractional value in a variable var1. As this variable var1 is declared with a int data type, so only an integer type value can be stored. Now when I run this code, you can see an error is raised because we have already defined a variable with an int data type, so we cannot store a fractional value inside in this variable. Now suppose if I store here a integer value and if I try to run this code, let's see what happens. So here you can see I did not got any error. So this is what data type is. Now let's have a look on different kinds of data types. So there are basically two types of data type. The first data type is a primitive data type and the second data type is non-primitive data types. Now suppose if you want to store a value like 2, 2.4 and these kind of value inside a variable then you can use primitive data types. So there are basically 8 types of primitive data types. Let's look at each of them in detail. So first is our byte data type. Now here in this byte data type the range of number that you can store is from minus 128 to 127. You can store integer only. So all these four data types like right? byte, short, int and long. These all are used to store integer kind of values. These float and double are used to store fractional values. So suppose if you want to store a value in a variable that is less than minus 128 and Great, uh, sorry, that is greater than minus 128 and less than 127. Then you can declare a variable with a byte keyword. So let's look at one example. So here I have a int variable. Now here if I try to store minus 220 and if I run this code, I get no error, right? But if I try to store this minus 222 into a byte type variable and if I try to run this code you can see I got error because it exceeded this limit. Suppose if I make this as minus 127 and I, then I try to run this code you can see no error got. So if you want to store a number in this range then you can use byte. Similar cases with short. So short is used to integer value in this range and the int is used to store an integer value in this range and similarly a long is used to store integer value in this range. Now you might be wondering all these are used to uh, store integer value then why don't we use long all the time. So the reason why we don't use long all the time because if you start to use long then it will start to consume large amount of memory. Your program will consume large amount of RAM. That is not good. Your code won't be optimized so it won't work fast. So if you know that your variable is having a value in this range only then better to declare that with a byte and if you know that your variable is not going to exceed this range then better declare that variable with int. Don't declare with that long or else your code will consume more memory. If it consumes more memory your code will become slow. Now we have seen that these variables we will use to store integer type of values. Now what we will do if you want to store a decimal value. So suppose if I write here like 4.25 and if I want to store it into a byte variable you can see I got error. I cannot use byte, int, long and short. Suppose if I make here int also and I run this code 
you can see I again get error. If I make this as short and run this code, I will again get error. And similar thing is going to happen with long too. Here I got error. But if suppose I make here is as float and then I run this code, you can see there is no error. Now here you can see I have put it this F. You might be wondering why I have put it this F. So this is a rule which you should remember. Whenever you assign a float value, assign a decimal value to a variable that is declared with float keyword, always try to put F at the end or else you will get an error. So suppose if I remove this F from here and then try to run this code, you can see an error is raised, right? So always put a F when you dis when you try to store a decimal value in a float type variable. So this is float. Now the double. So double is also used to store a decimal value. Suppose if here I make it as like double D O U B L E, and for double you don't have to put F. It's fine without F two. And you can see I'm able to successfully store a decimal value. So what is the difference between float and double? So the first difference is float consumes only four bytes of memory. So if you know that your number is going to be short, then better use float. RS always RS you can go for double. So this is the first difference, the memory difference. The second difference is that in float you have to put F and in case of double, there is no F required. The third difference is here you can see I have a decimal value with around seven numbers after point but you can see in the output I'm able to get only five numbers only. So this is the point which you have to remember. Whenever you use float you can store a decimal a number after decimal up to five only. Only five decimal numbers are allowed. But in case of float you can make this up to 15 decimal. So this is a third difference. Now comes boolean. So suppose if you want to store a true, a false value, a boolean value in a variable, then you have to declare a variable with a boolean data type. And suppose if you want to store a character enclosed in this single quotes, then you have to declare a variable with a char. So this is, we are done with primitive data types. Now let's have a look at non-primitive data type. So non-primitive data types are just the class name. So here, all this char, boolean, double, float, long, these are not the class names. But whenever your variable is declared with class name, so here this var1 is a class name. So whenever your variable is declared with a class name, then this class here is called as a non-primitive data type. Now, why we use these non-primitive data type? Suppose Wherever you find these kind of value that uh, if you find a new keyword after that you find uh, the name of the class then you have to declare the variable with that class name only. So that you can store the reference of this object. So what is object, how object works, you don't have to worry. In the coming lectures, I'm going to explain you what is object, how object works. As of now, just understand this. Whenever you find a class name declared with this new keyword, you always have to put the class name here also as a non permitted data type to store whatever is written by this in this variable. So this is all about our primitive data types and non primitive data types. Now we are going to learn about operators. So what are operators? In your, uh, while you were studying mathematics, you might have studied operators like plus or minus, which are used to perform addition on two numbers and subtraction on two numbers. In the similar way, if suppose the values or you can say the numbers are stored in variables, like here you can see right uh, like 10 is stored in variable a and 20 is stored in variable variable b now you have to perform the addition of these two values that is 10 plus 20 so you can use plus here like this 
So this plus in Java is called as operator. So this is what is operator. Now what this operator is doing, this operator is performing the operation on the values stored in these two variables a and p. So that is what operator do. Operator perform the operation on the values stored in the variables. So here when I run this code, you can see the here a plus b is equal to 30. So plus operator returns 30 and that will be stored in c and here we print c. So this is what is operator. Now there are four types of major operators that are used in Java. So first let's have a look at what are arithmetic operators. So arithmetic operators are the operators that are used to perform arithmetic operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. So this plus is used to perform addition operation, minus is used to perform subtraction, multiplication, division and similarly we have modulo. So let's have a look on each one of them. Here you can see we have value 13 and 2. Now when you do 13 plus 2 you will get 15. So here I have then x plus y and I got 15 here. In the similar way if you do x minus y you will get here 11 and if you do x into y that is 13 into 2 you will get 26 and this is a called as modulo operator. What modulo operator do? Modulo operator returns the remainder. Now when you divide 13 by 2 you will get a remainder as 1. That's the reason 1 is here. Now here if you divide 12 by 6 you will get as 2. So this is how arithmetic operator works. Now we have assignment operator. Uh, actually there are lot of assignment operators but this assignment operator is the one which is majorly used. So we are going to look into this only. Assignment operators are used to assign the value to the upper end which is at the left. So here you can see the value which is stored in variable y is now assigned to variable x. Right? Here you can see here I have a variable a and this assignment operator what it does it assign this 13 value to this variable a. So when I was trying to access the value from a here here I get as 13. So that's why assignment operators are used. Now we have relational operators. Relational operators are used to compare the values here you can see to compare the values stored in variables. Now let's look at the example. Here you can see I was just checking whether x is greater than y or not. And uh, the value stored in x is 8 and the value stored in y is 4. Here what I got? Here I got this as true. So what I was doing here? I was comparing using this greater than operator. I was just comparing whether the value stored in x is greater than y or not. So that is why relational operators are used to compare the values. So there are these uh, all relational operators. Equal to is used to check whether both the values are equal or not. This will return true if both the values are not equal if uh, th this is used to compare if x is greater if this x is greater than y or not and similarly this is less than and this is greater than or equal to okay if suppose both the values are equal then also this will return turn true and if suppose x is greater than y then also this will return true and uh, this is vice versa of this so here we are done with rational operators now we have logical operators. These, this and 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 this are called as logical operator. We call this operator as and operator and we call this operator as or operator. Now let's see how these operators work. So suppose you pass true here. You pass true here and here also you pass true then you will get true. And suppose you pass true and you pass false 
you get false just with end operator you have to remember one thing if one of the operand means if one or any one of the side is having false okay here also either it is having here false here false or both of the false it will return false so to if you want to get true value from this and operator you need to make sure that both the left and the right operand are true or else you will get false and this is our or operator in or operator if one in or operator just uh, vice in words of and operator in or operator if only one of the value if one of the operand is true you will get a true value so here you can see here at least this is true so that's why we got this true and here this is true we got true here this is true we again got true here you can see there is no true that's why we got as false so this is all about our operators now we are going to learn about strings in java so what is a string a string is character sequence of characters enclosed in double quotes so here you can see these characters are enclosed in this double quotes so this whole is called as a string and here we use a variable which is declared with a string data type to store the reference of this string now let's see few functions and operations that are mostly used on string so the first one is length so length is a function that is defined inside this string class so that's why we can use with this dot operator now what this length function will do length function returns the number of characters enclosed inside this double quotes as here tesla have five characters so that's why you can see this length function has returned five in here so this is what is the use of length now let's see plus operator now suppose you want to join two string to get a new string or you want to concatenate two string to get a new string what you can do you can just put a plus plus operator here and this plus operator will concatenate two string return a new string and you'll get a new string like this elon musk now a third function is char at now suppose you want to access the element of access the elements or i can say access the characters of this string then you can use char at function along with the indexes of the character in a string now suppose you want to access the this element l so first of all you have to calculate the index of this l element so the index of this l character is 1 now when you pass 1 to this char at function this char at function will return the character present in this one index and what it what is present at this one index that is l so l will be printed here so char at index 1 colon l and here one is l is printed now suppose if you want to print k then first let's calculate the index of k so the index of k will be like e is at index 0 l is at index 1 o is at index 2 n is at index 3 m is at index 4 u5 s 6 and k is at 7 so when you pass 7 here at char at this will return k so this is what string is and this is some few important operations and functions related to strings now let's start with the if else and switch statement so these if else and switch statements are called as conditional statements why they are used these conditional statements are used so if you have a need that you want to run a specific piece of code when the condition is met here what happens this code will run only when a is smaller than b and this code will only run when a is greater than b let's see this with an example so here first i'll just comment this code and i'll comment this out too this also i will comment this also i will comment now i'll run this code here you can see both of these line that is this line and this line got executed and a is smaller than b and a is greater than b is printed 
Now my requirement is that this line should only run when A is smaller than B and this line should only run when A is greater than B. So what I will do, I'll just uncomment this. So I have placed this conditional statement here and I have placed this conditional statement too in here. Now I will execute the code. So here you can see A is greater than B is printed. That is this line. That is this line A is greater than B is printed. Now suppose I make A smaller than B. That is if I make this as 1. Let's see what happens. So here you can see this line is executed because right now A is smaller than B. So this condition code executed. So this is how conditional statements work. Now let's see what are the different types of conditional statement. So there are three types of conditional statement. First is if, then if else, then comes a switch. So let's see what is if statement. So this is the normal syntax of if statement. This is how you can write the if block and inside here you can write the code which you want to execute when the condition, this condition is true. So here if the value comes true then only this code will run. So let's see how, how if block runs. Now here what I will do, I will simply do like this system dot out dot println i'll copy this and i will paste this so now you can see the value written by a equals to b so when i run this code here you can see this line is executed why this is executed because a equals to b returned true here you can see true is printed now what happens if I make this as 2, b equals to 2. Now you can see a equals to b returns false. As a equals to b returns false, that's why the compiler does not came inside this if block. That's why this line is not executed. So this is how if block works. Now let's look how if else statements work. So this is the core syntax of if else statement. Here you will pass the boolean condition and if the condition is true, this code will execute and if suppose this condition is false, then this code will execute. Let's understand with an example. So here I open this code. Now again what I will do, I'll just copy this and I'll again paste it here. I will copy this too and paste here. Now if I run this, see what happens. So A equals to B equals to equals to B returns true. As A equals to equals to B returns true. So the code inside if block executes and A is equals to B got printed. Now what happens when this A equals to equals to B returns false? So for that, I'll make this as 2 and now let's see what happens. So when this is returning false means here when false comes, what happens? The code inside else block execute. That is A is not equal to B. So from this example, you can conclude that when the condition is true, the code inside if block execute. When the condition is false, then the code inside else block execute. So this is how if else block works. Now let's see a third conditional statement that is switch statement. Switch is an alternate approach to if else statement. So let's see how if else state, how a switch statement works. So here's our code. Now I executed this code and you can see today is Tuesday got printed. So means this line is executed. So before we understand this code, let's look at the syntax of this code. So this is how the syntax of this code looks like. So if this expression, if this expression, here are this expression is our Tuesday, means this a day. If this expression is equals to one of the value, value one or value two, whatever the value it is equals to, it will execute the code what, it, what is written here. 
So here you can see as a Tuesday is equal to this Tuesday. So that is why this line of code got executed and today is Tuesday got printed here. Suppose here I make this as Monday. Here if I make as Monday. Now let's see what happens. I forgot to put N. And now let's see what happens. So here you can see as this Monday match with this Monday. That's where this code is executed and today is Monday printed here. Now suppose if I make this as Wednesday. Let's see what happens. So now when I made this as Wednesday, this code is executed. And remember one thing, you have to always put a break statement after this, after the code of this case. Now let's see what happens when the condition does not meet any of the conditions. So we will understand with this example, maybe we are with uh, this example we are going to understand so let me close this out and i will open this here you can see i have a day as friday and you can see if here also we don't have friday here also we don't have friday here also we don't have friday now when i execute this let's see which code executes so now execute today is sunday so means this code got executed so when none of the condition meets, then the code present in the default block get executed. So this is all about our conditional statements. Now let's start with loops. So there are two types of loops in Java that are mostly used. So first one is for loop and the second one is while loop. Let's understand how loops work with this example. Now I'll comment this out and this also I'll comment out and this also I will comment out. Now I'll run this code and let's see what happens. So here you can see this and this piece of code got executed only once. Now let's see what happens when I remove this comment and I will remove this too and I will remove this too. And now when I run, let's see what happens. So here you can see one two three four five so this piece of code got executed repeatedly for five times so this happened because of this loop so from this example we can conclude that loops are used to execute a piece of code repeatedly now how these loops work when this loop terminate and how many types of loops are there in java that's we are going to learn now i will close this so there are basically two types of loop. First is for loop and the second one is while loop. So let's first understand the working of for loop. So here is a code. And now I will run this. And this is what the output we got. Suppose if I remove this, then this will, this will run only once. So here also for loop is used to repeatedly execute this piece of code now let's look at the working of this for loop so in this for loop in the first iteration as we have seen that uh, this code executed five times so when this was executed first time means when this was printed let's see what happened at that point of time so the first iteration this it was executed and this was executed and as the value of i is initialized to zero due to the execution of this line here zero comes and five into zero equals to zero got printed now in the second iteration the value of i is one so here you can see the value of i is one so how this became one this code executed at the last at the last here here this code executed this i equals to 0 plus 1 so that's why here 1 came before i move forward just want to remind us that this code i equals to 0 and i smaller than 5 this always executed before before 
this before this curly braces and this execute after this curly brace so here also you can see right i equals to 0 and i smaller than 5 executed before this curly brace and i e i plus plus executed after this curly braces so as this executed after this curly braces so the value of i became 1 so here you can see the value of i is 1 now let's see what happened in second iteration in second iteration as here we have 1 is smaller than 5 so here as we have 1 smaller than 5 this will return true the loop will continue and again at the last we'll get i equals to 1 plus 1 that is 2 and again here we will get 2 as again 2 is smaller than 5 this will return true the loop continues we again print this 5 into 2 equals to train and here the value of i will become 3 and this will go on and in this last second iteration what happens the value of i will become 5 now when the value of i is 5 what happens java will try to compare is 5 is smaller than 5 no 5 is not at all smaller than 5 so this will return false as this return false this loop gets terminated the code inside these curly braces will not at all execute now so this is how a for loop works now let's see how while loop works before we learn while loop how while loop works let's see what is the difference between for loop and while loop so in for loop we have this i int i equals to zero inside the curly braces and uh, we have i is smaller than five also inside the curly braces and we have i plus plus also inside the curly braces uh, sorry not inside the curly braces inside the parenthesis now here you can see in while loop only i smaller than 5 is inside curly braces so this is the major difference that you cannot initialize and you cannot increment a variable inside the parenthesis of while loop that you have to do outside or inside this while loop so here you can see i have done the initialization of variable i outside this while loop and increment of uh, variable i inside the while loop not inside the parent inside the parenthesis of this while loop now let me run this code and see what happens so as i run this code you will get the output like this now let's understand how we got this output so here have this now let's see what happened in the first iteration so in the first iteration in the first iteration first this i become equals to zero so the value of i will become equals to zero and here we will get true because zero is smaller than five and uh, we'll get in the output as five into zero equals to zero now here the value of i will increment and it will become i and the value of i will become 1 now in the second iteration second iteration again 1 is small than 5 yes 1 is small than 5 so this will again return to the code inside this will execute the value of i will become equals to 2 and again here will get true again this code will run and here also again we will run this code inside the while loop and this will go on now in the last iteration what happens the value of i will become 5 now when the value of i is 5 is 5 is smaller than 5 no so this smaller than i operator will return false as this will return false this while loop will terminate so this is how the for loop and while loop works in java we have two types of statements break and continuous statements these statements are used to interrupt the loop so let's first start with break statement break statement is used if you want to come out of the loop that means if you want to break the loop let's see how now let me open this here when i execute this code you can see break at i colon 3 is printed so when this break is executed this loop the 
loop got baked. So let me just comment out, then we'll see how it works. Now when I execute this, let's see what happens. So i colon 0, i colon 1, 2, 3, 4. It got printed till 4. Earlier what happened? Earlier this thing didn't got printed, right? So means the loop got terminated when this break keyword is called. So we will learn, we'll see how this whole break works. So let me uncomment this and I'll just copy this and uh, let me just run this code once. So here is the code with a break statement. So I'll put it here. So in our first iteration, what happens? I'll just move this up. In our first iteration, this line will execute and here we will get zero and here again we will get zero. So this line of code will not execute at all because zero is not equals to three and this code will execute here i'll get zero due to this i colon zero is printed here and here i again get zero and the value of i will become one now let's see what happens in second iteration so in second iteration here so first of all this line of code will execute only in the first iteration because now we are inside value so that's why this will not execute after first iteration in second iteration what happens here in the at the last of the first iteration we had the value of one as i as one so here we will get as one i'll make this as one and i'll make this as one too so i equals to equals to three and this is not equals to three so this code will again not execute and here I have to put again one. So that's why I got i colon one and here this will again become one and the value of i will become two. Now what happens in case of third iteration? In case of third iteration, here I'll get three. Yes, three is smaller than five. So this condition is true. We'll get inside this and I'll put three. Now three become equals to three. So the code inside this if block will execute. Now when this code execute, first of all, break at i here, here we will get as three. So it will print break at i colon three. Now again this loop, when it comes to this break statement, the loop will terminate. As the loop terminates, so this code will not at all print and the compiler earlier it was here after executing this code it the call will come to here so whatever the code you will write after this will execute this code will not at all execute even this while loop will not go to next iteration too so this is how the break statement works now let's move on and see how continuous statement works so break is used to terminate the loop. Now suppose if you wanted to skip a specific iteration of a loop, suppose here you don't want to print i colon 1, then in that case you can use continuous statement. Let's see how. So I'll close this out and I'll open this code and then we'll understand. So first of all, I'll just remove this and I'll run the code without continuous statement so here you can see this is what my output is and i'll paste this here and now suppose i just uncomment this code and now i will run this okay i got some error i missed something what i missed what i missed so let me do in this way Control c and just reload this okay so here this was our okay so this thing i can't put it let me just comment it out now i will run this code and see let's what happens so this is my output with this continuous statement so here you can see i did not printed this i colon 3 i skipped this code at i equals to 3 so this continue i used to skip 
this code when i this code when i is equal to 3 due to this i colon 3 is not at all printed here in the output let's see how this continue works i will copy this i will paste it here and this is our first iteration in a first iteration first our i will get initialized we'll get here zero and as zero is more than five we'll come inside while loop is zero is equal to equal to three zero is not equal to three so we will not execute this code i'll just uncomment this code now let me move forward a little bit up now here again we will get it as zero so that's why i printed it got printed here i colon zero now here i again get at zero and this will become the value of i will become equals to zero sorry equals to one so this is our first iteration now let's see what happens in the second iteration in the second iteration and let me move a little bit up and this code will not execute this execute only before we were not into while loop as we came into while loop this code is not cannot execute now the value of i here is in the last of the first addition the value of i became one so here i will put as one one is small than five will come inside while loop this one is not equal to three will not print this now here again we'll make this as one and we will make this as a one two so this will become two as here i colon one is one so we printed i colon one here now we move to third iteration in third iteration here this is a third iteration this uh, you can see this was a two in the last of second iteration i'll make as two two is more than five we come inside while loop two is equal to equal to three no t is not equal to three so this will return fall this code will not execute and here we will again make this as two and here we will make as two and this will become as three now as here we have two so that's why we got here i colon two now again i will copy this and i'll paste it here and this will become our fourth iteration what the value of i was in the last or third iteration it was three so i'll make it as three we'll come inside while loop and here we'll get three yeah three is now equals equals to three so i'll just uncomment this code okay and here i'll make this as three this will also become as three so here the value of i will be value of i will be four and now when this continue execute this piece of code when i is equal to three will not at all execute so i will just comment this out here you can see the only this continue at i is printed i colon three is not printed here so that is how the continuous statement works now let's look at our fifth iteration too so for fifth iteration i will take this and here you can see the value of i was four so here again we will get as four we will come inside by loop and uh, is four equals equals to three no again this code will not execute and this code will execute that's why we got here i colon four so here we use continue to skip a piece of code at a particular value of i so that is how continue and break statements work now we are going to learn about arrays in java so to create array you have to use these curly braces this and this and this is how you can create an array let's see within code so this is my code now in this you can see this is how i have created an array using these curly braces so there are some rules while we create an array so what are those rules let's look into it so the for only one rule is there the for the rule is that you should have only one type of element inside an array it can't be like you can have string also here or you can have a double type 
So if you have created a to store int type of numbers, then you should have an array which is store int only. So suppose if I put here like string, if I make this as a string and then I run this code, you'll get an error. Or suppose if I make this as a string, if I make this as a string, then you can store only string type values inside this array. I have to remove this and I have to make this as string. See, now if I run this code, I will not, uh, I'm still getting error, string, string. Now let's see. So I did not got any error, but if I make this as like integer, and uh, then I run this code. Let's see what happens. So here I got error. So whatever you are, have declared an array with, you can have only that kind of elements inside it. It can't be that you can have um, elements of all different kinds inside an array. So this is how you can create an array using curly braces. And this is the rule which you have to remember. Now let's first understand how to use an array. Then we will see what are the different ways to create an array so here if suppose you want to access uh, the element at index 0 so before we move on to index index how to use index let's understand what index is so here you can see the element first the first element the element uh, 10 is at position number 1 so i can write the position so here i will write the position position mm, I'll just comment this out so the position of element 10 is 1 and the position of element 20 is 2 similarly of 3 is 3 3 30 is 3 and that of 40 is 4 and that of 50 is 5 now let me copy this and put it here now we will see what are indexes indexes and how it starts in real world we say the position of element 10 is 1 but actually in java java starts to position these elements in an array starting from 0 so here it will position the element 0 at uh, position the element 10 at index 0 and uh, Java will position the element 20 at number 1. Similarly, 30 have uh, index of 2 and uh, 4 will, 40 will have index of 4, si not 4, it will have 3 and 50 will have an index of 4. So these are called as indexes. Indexes are nothing but the position given by Java to these elements in an array. Now let's see, so this is how we have created an array and uh, we have stored its friends in this ARR variable and just one more point which I want to remind you, whenever you create an array, you have to put these square brackets. If suppose I remove them and then I run this code, you'll get this error. But if I put this back and then I run this code, I will not get any error. So make sure whenever you define a variable, define it with this brace square brackets now if you want to access the element 10 so you have to pass the index of that element like this so here i want to access the first element first element of this arr array so what is the index of this first element the index of this first element is zero so i passed here zero and i got here as 10. now i want to access this last element so what I have to do, first I have to calculate the index of this last element. So the index of this last element is 4. And when I pass this 4 inside this ARR, then I get in return the element which is at the last position. So the element at the, the index 4 is 50. So I got that. So this is how you can create an array. And this is how you can access the elements of an array. Now let's see how you can create an array using new keyword so this is also one more way to create an array 
so i'll just remove this because this is no more required and i will just comment out here i have commented out now let's see a different way so here this has to be five now if i run this code you can see i am still able to access the elements of an array so it means i have created the same array which i have created here using this i have created using this method 